Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone around the world, and welcome to what we expect to be a lively and interactive discussion on how movements maintain resilience and momentum in the face of repression. My name is Maria Steffen, and I direct the program on nonviolent action at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I will be moderating today's event. We are grateful to have a terrific lineup of scholars and activists joining us from various parts of the world to provide insight on this timely and important topic. And of course, we will be taking questions from our global online audience throughout the event. So please feel free to comment and put questions into the chat box. Just a bit about USIP. The U.S. Institute of Peace is a nonpartisan, independent institution that works with local partners, experts, and practitioners to help prevent and resolve violent conflict in different parts of the world. Our program on nonviolent action focuses on the role of civil resistance and people power movements in advancing just and sustainable peace. Our team conducts applied research, supports education and training in strategic nonviolent action and movement building, and seeks to amplify grassroots voices in national and global policy fora. Today's event is inspired by a couple of countervailing trends in the international community. On the one hand, authoritarianism is resurgent and democracy is taking a hit around the world with declines in global political rights and civil liberties for the past 13 years. On the other hand, we are witnessing a veritable explosion of activism and people power movements globally. From Latin America to Hong Kong to Sudan and Algeria, people are taking to the streets and engaging in nonviolent direct action in unprecedented numbers. In all those places, activists have faced various forms of state and non-state repression, ranging from cyber attacks to police brutality to attacks by government-backed paramilitary forces. Often, governments will deploy agent provocateurs to foment protester violence in an attempt to delegitimize movements. How have movements responded to these forms of repression? What strategic and tactical decisions have they made to maintain resilience and momentum? What are the lessons from research and past cases that could inform current movements? To answer these questions and many more from you all in our Facebook Live audience, I now turn to our virtual panel of speakers. I will briefly introduce them and they will then kick off our conversation and then I would encourage you to not be shy about adding questions and comments as we uh, go forward with the conversation. So first we will be hearing from Johnson Young, who is a Hong Kong human rights activist and um, advocate and activist who works on issues related to freedom of assembly and expression and protection for, for human rights defenders. He chairs the board of the Hong Kong, Hong Kong Civil Club Hub, which produces briefings on shrinking civic space and builds solidarity with international rule of law and human rights communities. We will be hearing from Ziad Busan. Ziad is a Tunisian activist for democracy and human rights. He works as a researcher covering governance, public policy, and human rights for a research center called Pandora. Ziad also works as a trainer focusing on these same topics for Tunisian, Libyan, and Moroccan associations. Azaz Al Shami has more than 15 years of experience in public diplomacy, policy research, and advocacy. She focuses on Africa and the Middle East with a particular focus on Sudan and the Gulf. She is also an expert trainer on nonviolent resistance, citizen journalism, and peace building. Ivan Maravic is a leading practitioner in the field of strategic civil resistance. He serves as director of global training and movement support for the organization RISE. He previously was an active member of the youth-led pro-democracy movement in Serbia and has worked with dozens of activists and movements globally. Victoria Hui is an associate professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame. Her research examines the centrality of war in the formation and transformation of China throughout history. She writes and comments frequently on Hong Kong politics for various media outlets. 
And finally, Jonathan Pinckney is a program officer for USIP's program on nonviolent action. Previously, he was a postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Sociology and Political Science at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. His research examines extra-institutional political contention in non-democracies with a focus on nonviolent civil resistance. So Johnson, we are gonna kick off the, the discussion with you. Uh, you have been part of the recent round of pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong uh, that were initially triggered by the Hong Kong government's imposition of the extradition bill, which has since been shelved. Uh, the demonstrations have attracted mass participation and the Hong Kong government and police have been accused of excessive use of force. At the same time, there has been an increase in the use of violent tactics by protesters. However, as we saw most recently, pro-democracy legislators recently won a landslide um, in the district council elections. So I wanted to start by asking you how you would assess the state of the democracy movement in Hong Kong and how is it dealing with repression? Thank you, Maria. And thank you for uh, having me in these discussions. It's been amazing. Um, so yeah, Hong Kong is still in the mix of unrest and the protest movement has continued for six months since June and there's no sign that it will soon blow off. So the movement right now is still retaining a strong support from the population that more than 84% of the population demand an independent inquiry into police brutality, which is a major demand of the protest. And, but, but on the other hand, yeah, yeah, you mentioned about uh, the pro-democracy camp win a landslide in the previous local election. Will that um, defer the energies of protest movement into institutional buildings or formal politics? I, I think it is not that simple. The short answer for that is no, because the district council is mandated to govern neighborhood duties like garbage collections and traffic contractions. So what democracy can gain from this win is resources, because each district councillors will get roughly um, 700,000 USD allowance and on non realms, and this will provide uh, material resources for organizers to build power from below. And uh, the landslide win also energized the movement because it proved that uh, many uh, of the amongst the populations are supporting the demands of the protests. A lot of candidates who was running for this election, they were using the protest demand as their major uh, electoral platform. Now, I think the problem that Hong Kong people is facing now is Beijing is unwilling to make concessions and they are going to continue to back the administrations of Hong Kong. Um, so the future, in a sense, it looks quite gloomy. And the protesters, has, although they have successfully disrupted the administration, the Hong Kong government is losing allies, pro-government parties and business elites is keeping their distance from Kerry Lam. But So if, if this scenario happens in other nation states, then the presidents will probably resign and substantial reform will be met. But Hong Kong is not a nation state, nor is real enemy AKA Chinese Communist regime is, um, is, is, is being besieged or challenged in its own territory. So this is what we are, the situation that we are facing now that I'm still think, I, I still believe that Beijing is going to tighten its grip by uh, taking control or heavily influence into institutions like at the Gimlias, like media outlets uh, or schools. So uh, the future is a little bit gloomy. Now, you mentioned a little bit about the uh, violence, the escalating violence and use of force um, by the protester. And I would, I would like to adjust this point, which is why um, the Hong Kong protesters are escalating the uh, use of force uh, and not uh, relying solely on non-violent tactics. Um, that is because a lot of peaceful means are exhausted. A lot of legitimate channels to channel the grievances of the people have already been shut down. Um, what Hong Kong people is facing now is torture under detention, uh, arbitrary arrest, and the Hong Kong government is also recognizing its law against its people, like imposing de facto curfew or uh, the mass ban that was inflicted um, in October. So that's part of the reason why some people resolve um, to violence and sometimes uh, using uh, using force from the protesters does have some utility. So, you know, for, for example, 
it does stop some of the police from harassing people and torture people after work. Uh, it does um, galvanize some of the popular support um, because people feel they are fighting back and there's hope uh, in, in this fight. Um, but what we are tr really trying to prevent in here is um, Hong Kong becoming uh, a um, movement that solely relies on uh, militant measures. And I think this is uh, like as organizers or as academia, that's something we need to um, uh, really research and, and, and look into. That is how a mixed strategy can uh, 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 cooperate and collaborate with each other so we can get the, the, uh, uh, the most of it. Thank you, Johnson. And we'll talk a little bit um, a little bit later about what the research suggests about the mixing of violent and nonviolent tactics, because it's not um, it's not evident, let's say, that it always helps um, a movement. But we'll, we'll hear from J uh, Jonathan about that point. But let me bring in Victoria. Uh, Victoria Hui is someone who's written about the, the Hong Kong pro-democracy movement from the Umbrella Movement in 2014 to the current round of protest. What would you say are the greatest strengths of the movement right now? And what are the biggest challenges that lie ahead? Um, so essentially, I would say that the best strengths that this movement has are the kind of the keywords, unity, commitment, broad-based support, and international support. At the same time though, I would say that these are also the reasons they also have become the targets for Beijing's crackdown. So think about, you know, Mass protests. Hong Kong for a long time, for decades, is very famous for the massive protest. Hong Kong has 7.5 million population. And then um, you can see 1 million, 2 million people protesting. And so you, given your research in, your, your, um, your research in Ericas, that you show that if you have 3.5% of the population all organized, uh, rallying around a particular cause, you should achieve success. But Hong Kong repeatedly goes way beyond this 3.5 threshold. So then what the police are doing is to, you, because in Hong Kong you have to have a, a no objection permit from the police in order to have uh, lawful assemblies. And by denying that permit to the organizers, then any assembly becomes unlawful, subject to police use of force. Another thing is that Hong Kong people are also very, very artistic and they have done all kinds of artwork in order to support the protest. There have been Lennon walls, essentially democracy walls. They are, they are also human chains. And so these activities are subject to the same kind of unlawful assemblies. And not just that, not just um, that, you know, if you gather without a permit, you can be arrested, but also because there have been thugs who are around with knives to attack young people who are trying to put up posters and post-it notes or to try to protect the walls. And another strength is commitment. So commitment, meaning that these days, the young people are really willing to just sacrifice everything. They are fighting the last stand. And then during the umbrella movement, people would actually turn themselves in at the police stations and because they have faith that the judicial system is going to, you know, if, I'm, if I have broken any law, I'm willing to take the consequences. But this time, it seems that the, the police understand that, that if they take people to the court, then many of them would be they released. And so they need a people, I call this a decapacitation campaign, and they are doing so with impunity. They beat up people when they arrest them and they also beat them, them up more, torture them up more in detention centers. So then they, it would take them, you know, for entire entire decade probably to even recover. Some of them actually suffer from um, disabilities as a result. And you can also hear from uh, some top politicians that we just basically have lost interest in the entire young generation. So it's kind of this really concerted efforts to wipe out the young people. Now, another strength is the broad base of societal support. And that then has invited kind of essentially Beijing has been using whole of society crackdown. So civil servants are behind this and any civil servants who are arrested, whether or not they're doing anything on the street, if they happen to be even just by the by politicized, if they're arrested, they get dismissed. Cathay Pacific, um, many crew members joined the, the general strike on August 5th, they got fired. And then universities and students and, and, and secondary schools are now targets of um, repression. So I would say that another thing that seems to be, you so saw in other cases in South Africa, for example, consumer boycotts are very, very effective. But in Hong Kong, we're dealing with China and they have so much money, they have so much economic power. So NBA, one guy made a tweet to stand with Hong Kong and then um, NBA would be banned in China. 
And so this goes back to, I think, to in order to maintain resilience, the best thing that I've seen that's going to allow people to do that is um, still target the boycott, but in a sense of identifying the pro-democracy businesses and pro-democracy young people connecting each other. Their apps doing that, their business, business is doing that. So that would be the, the best way. And even but when it comes to elections, um, so with the district council elections that happen on November 24th, the um, pro-democracy councils, candidates could win because uh, this election was based on first past the post. But with the legislative council election next mm -hmm. time, it's going to be based on proportional representation. And it is designed to keep pro-democracy councillors in perpetual uh, minority. So these are a lot of the challenges. Thank you, Victoria. So I wanted to <clears throat> bring in Azaz Al-Shami, who's been very actively involved in the pro-democracy movement in Sudan. And we were just noting before we went live that it's almost at the one year anniversary um, of the mass protests in Sudan that culminated in um, the ouster of Omar Bashir, um, longtime dictator who was accused of war crimes. So this was a case of a popular movement going against an accused um, genocidaire, if you will. So I wanted to just ask um, Azaz, we heard that, you know, um, from Johnson and we hear from activists often in some of the most um, difficult and repressive context around the world that we've, we've tried everything. Um, we've exhausted all of our nonviolent options. So there's only one thing left and that's violence. So I just wanted to get your sense thinking about the Sudanese uh, popular movement of how do you explain how this movement was able to uh, stand down and face um, a regime accused of war crimes and prevail? Sure. Uh, thank you, Maria and USAID for hosting this. And um, for so for the revolution that took place in um, in December 2018, uh, it actually rightly so. It started by a small uh, protest uh, in a school in on the 13th in the Damazin. But the revolution did not only start in 2018. It has been an accumulative uh, movement that started as early as 2005. Um, uh, when I did some research about the first act of dissent of public protest or uh, sitting or picketing, it actually it goes back to 2005. And ever since, uh, the, the, a lot of interest groups and a lot of movements in Sudan have been uh, working internally, but a little bit in solo, they were not interconnected. And I think what happened in 2018, in December, it was, it was an opportune moment where all these movements that have been working together uh, uh, met with a leadership that was actually uh, almost by coincidence, which is the Sudanese Professional Association. Um, and, and, and throughout these years, since 2005 until 2018, uh, all these movements or groups or interest groups were, had grievances. They tried the institutional path uh, by trying to negotiate with the government, trying to have petitions or, or representation or something like that. And they all felt like it was going to fail or they didn't it didn't bring fruit so they started to go against the government and as you noted uh, the Sudanese government is notorious and it has a very uh, dark uh, track record when it comes to human rights uh, um, uh, and, and human rights violation uh, but I would say that what the, whatever these movements and these moving parts that made of uh, that makes the Sudanese revolution had two characteristics that made it successful one is is something internal that is characteristic to the movement itself and another is external that that is something outside of it the internal thing is the core model most of them were strong grassroots organization uh, and by grassroots uh, that what made it very integral and, and and important and critical to this movement is that it was not elitist it was not central uh, you would find stakeholders across the country from different social economic backgrounds with different grievances people who already had tried their own uh, um, tactics in their own struggle now coming together for something beyond uh, uh, their small group and the other thing uh, about the character the characteristics of the movement it was the inclusiveness uh, by inclusiveness I, I I mean at all level like at gender wise age wise social economics racial geographic uh, you would have like mass marshes in the very small town that's called Atlas al Magariba, which a lot of people might not even be able to point it on a map uh, that can be similar and akin to that you would find in Bur Sudan or Khartoum. So this inclusiveness and this mass uh, 
scale uh, uh, made it also successful. It became inevitable for people not to join. And also they were very persistent. And maybe we can talk later about the aggression uh, from the state that varied from a arresting to torture to people even dying um, uh, in, in, in the government facility and then uh, mounting up to this big massacre that took place on June 3rd. Uh, and again, in, in the face of all of this repression and aggression, the people remain persistent. And the persistency was not something that it, it, it superhuman what they did they did something very smart by preserving their uh, their their energy and having a scheduled uh, 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 revolutionary schedule if you will that where they they, they streamlined and organized their act, uh, tactics and and how they do it and 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 ration their energy and the third internal a uh, aspect is the leadership the leadership uh, uh, in this movement specifically now in this revolution was the today's Special association that actually orchestrated was like a, uh, the the lead of the orchestra, telling people uh, the themes, telling people where to go, telling people what days to do, what what days to mobilize, and that was very central in a sense that. The, uh, the guidelines are central, but at the same time, move, uh, the, the components of the movement across the country have their own agency to execute that plan. So it was central in the guidance sense, but at the same time, it was decentralized enough for people to uh, uh, have a room and a way for them to uh, do their own. And, the, uh, and, and also remaining uh, nonviolent. Uh, that was a very big challenge. To a lot of people, and 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 it was really interesting to see how the movements remained violent, not only just as a logical um, choice that this is minimizes my loss, but it was also part of the future of how they see this country that it belongs to them, and they need to preserve it, and they need to make sure that it's intact once they win. So almost like being so and believing conviction that this. A war or this battle, it will end in their favor, and they don't want to have a lot of damage that could hinder their start. Uh, the the other component that made this uh, movement successful was the external uh, help, and that can be seen in the diaspora support. Uh, Sudanese has a big diaspora around the world, and they were very integral and helpful and and, and supportive of this movement in many ways when it comes to fundraising, when it comes to advocacy when it comes to bringing the attention to the situation in Sudan, when it comes to documentation. And also, uh, they were very integral when it came to uh, amplifying the message when the country was under siege by uh, the internet uh, shutdown that took place almost like 35 days uh, after the massacre on June 3rd. So I feel like um, it was all these interlocking blocks about the, the core of the movement being central being very, being very grassroots, so being very close to the people and the stakeholders, and being very exclusive, uh, being geographically spread and not elitist or centralized, and also the the support that they get from outside, from Sunni people themselves, who who were like almost like ambassadors or um, uh, 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 to reflect the the, the movement uh, uh, stages and struggle and, ch and challenges. Thank you, Azaz. That was that was really interesting, and I I thought it was um, interesting choice of words that you preserved your energy in the movement and kind of um, in order to sustain um, over the longer term. Um, in the interest of mixing activism and scholarship, I wanted to now uh, turn to, to Jonathan Pinckney. Jonathan, you've researched uh, the dynamics of civil resistance campaigns and recently published uh, a special report with the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict on making or breaking nonviolent discipline in nonviolent movements. And while I personally can't imagine any movement, particularly one facing a repressive opponent that could ever be perfectly nonviolent, what does the literature, the growing body of literature, I might add, suggest about the results of movements using violence, even unarmed forms of violence? Thanks, Maria. Yeah. I mean, this is an incredibly crucial question because exactly as you brought up, uh, it's very rare to see a movement, particularly a movement that has faced significant amounts of violent repression from the state uh, that remains entirely nonviolent. Uh, but this means, of course, that it's very difficult to analyze these things at a movement level uh, from the scholarly perspective uh, because sort of small degrees of incidental violence uh, often accompany 
almost every movement. So it's difficult to tease these things apart. So most of the work that's been, you know, there are scholars who argue on the one hand that even small levels of violence uh, tend to undermine a movement's chances of success. Others who argue that some kind of violence, particularly uh, violence without the use of arms can be beneficial. Uh, and others who argue that there isn't really much, uh, much difference uh, one way or the other. Um, so on a macro level, it's difficult to say things with a, a high degree of certainty. But I think there are, there are three specific points on this uh, that I think we do have a lot of information about. Uh, a lot of good studies have been done, uh, and I think help us to, to get into this in a little bit more detail. And the first uh, is that nonviolent events tend to lead to short-term government concessions at a much higher rate than violent events. So we're not talking about sort of the overall success of the movement, but just in terms of the government making some kind of success of uh, concession, some kind of short-term gain for the movement, this tends to happen most frequently uh, in response to nonviolent events rather than violent events. Uh, and so this means that it can be, a lot, if a movement is dominated by violent events, uh, it can be a lot harder to build that mo gradual momentum over time that can maintain the energy, uh, like Azaz was talking about, uh, and ultimately lead to a longer term success. So fewer concessions uh, in, in, violent, uh, in violent response to violent events. Second, and sort of uh, in you know, kind of the inverse, violent events are much more likely to face extreme levels of government repression uh, relative to nonviolent events. And we see this across you know, many, many different contexts, whether that's in dictatorships, democracies, uh, anywhere. And of course, uh, this can be one of the major factors that saps a movement's strength, undermines its resilience, uh, and prevents people from sort of maintaining, uh, maintaining a commitment to the movement uh, over the long term. Now, if a movement is particularly large uh, or is facing a, a weak opponent, uh, then these higher levels of repression uh, may not, you know, may not be particularly important in affecting the, the movement's overall chances of success. Uh, but if a movement is facing a, a particularly strong state, uh, then these, uh, this impact on resilience is likely to be particularly crucial. And then third, uh, we know from many, many different studies across many different contexts uh, that on average, uh, the use of violence by an opposition movement tends to undermine uh, people's external support for it uh, and increase the degree to which external observers uh, view government repression as justified and understandable. Um, so this has mostly been done uh, by scholars doing sort of different kinds of survey experiments uh, or this kind of work. My own work, uh, I've recently completed a study where we surveyed 5,000 people across 33 countries, uh, found that when we depicted a movement uh, as being violently repressed by the government, uh, a peaceful movement, that significantly decreased uh, whether people said the government had justice on its side but if we changed it and said, okay, the government is engaging in the same kind of oppression, but of a violent movement, that increased the amount of, to which people said the government was justified more so than it was decreased when the movement was peaceful. So this can have a really significant uh, effect in, uh, in undermining people's support for a, for a movement uh, and increasing the degree to which people view the government's actions as justified. And this isn't necessarily 100% of the time, some violence in a movement, of course, doesn't mean uh, that it's doomed to failure, not at all, uh, particularly if this violence is perceived, uh, if uh, violence by the movement is perceived as proportionate uh, relative to extreme levels of, uh, of government repression. Uh, but it certainly comes with these particular challenges. Thanks, Jonathan. I wanted to um, just see before we uh, talk with Ziad if either Victoria or uh, Johnson had any particular questions for, for Jonathan before we move on. Yeah, I think Jonathan has made a very good point about uh, the complexities of violence, whether you know, in, in some of the contests, which, which is something that I also witnessed in Hong Kong. Um, that is, you know, the violence of the protester has to be proportionate and it has to be justified, it has to be fed by a reasoning. Um, and if the interesting fact about the uh, use of force of Hong Kong protester, there are several characteristics of it. One, uh, it is proportionate to the police crackdown. So, you know, usually the police and uh, the military police, they use a very high levels of force while the protester were only throwing bricks. So, um, 
uh, wielding violence against the backdrops of Hong Kong society, um, the use of force from the protester, it's not that serious. And I think this is part of the reason why it doesn't lose um, popular support. And the second characteristics is those violence are very targeted to um, the government or the coolies of the government. So we see some vandalisms of um, empty hour services and some businesses. We also see uh, violence against the police. But um, part of the reason uh, why it, uh, uh, the protest movement maintains support uh, is because they are very targeted. Um, so what we, uh, according to a public survey done by Independence Academia, um, more than 60% of the Hong Kong populations uh, said it is justifiable and they can understand why protesters will use radical measures uh, when the government is not responding to the movement. And I think this explains why uh, popular support uh, being proportionate is something that uh, um, uh, every stakeholder in the movement has to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thanks, Johnson. Um, I wanted to just, um, you know, Jonathan, have in mind maybe um, kind of some additional insights from the research, but I wanted to bring in Ziad from, from Tunisia. Um, you know, T Tunisia is an interesting case where it was the first of the Arab Spring uprisings, um, the Jasmine Revolution, which um, resulted in the departure of another dictator, Ben Ali. And it was a case where the same groups that were leading the, the civil resistance ended up um, being the lead negotiators um, for the, the, the pathway to democracy and negotiating the, the democratic transition. And so, you know, and, and at the same time, the activists were facing a lot of, um, you know, government violence, police brutality. And a lot of the current activism in, in Tunisia today is still focused on these very issues of uh, security force accountability and, and police violence. So I wanted to just ask Ziad, kind of what have you observed about how how uh, movements in Tunisia can best and most effectively engage uh, with security forces. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone, first. Uh, so, uh, yes, we it's almost uh, uh, 10 years now since uh, the revolution, nine years exactly. Uh, ben Ali uh, is dead, dead in July, last July. Um, and uh, I, I'm happy to, to bring up some memories from uh, 2000 and, uh, late 2010 and uh, 2011. Um, when the uh, protests started in December 2010, uh, it started first, as you may know, uh, outside of the capital city. All the dictatorship of Ben Ali um, was uh, built on uh, a strong administration, especially on a central level. So everything uh, uh, started outside of uh, Tunis, the capital city, and then uh, uh, Tunis was the last one, let's say, to move, uh, if I may say that. Um, on the first protests we did on the, in the streets of Tunis, nothing was really coordinated. Uh, when we saw, on the other hand, that police, uh, special forces, and even anti-terrorist forces uh, were deployed in the streets to counter us, common citizens, we, uh, we decided to organize ourselves. Um, so it, our way of organizing ourselves, le, let's say, uh, was based on three ideas. The first one um, was that uh, the ideal thing is to hide behind institutions. Uh, 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 let me explain. Before 2011, we didn't really have any civil society uh, in a democratic uh, sense, uh, only uh, five or six organizations. Um, and the idea was to push these organizations, uh, like uh, the uh, Tunisian uh, Human Rights League or the UGTT, the main uh, uh, union in uh, workers' union in Tunisia, to push them. Uh, to take uh, a position and support the movement. And once UGTT or uh, the uh, Human Rights uh, Defenders Association agreed to do that, we had uh, a kind of a legal uh, umbrella under which we could uh, go uh, in the streets. Uh, otherwise, we would have faced uh, uh, much, brutal, uh, much more brutal uh, oppression. Uh, the second thing is we used what we had under uh, our hands, uh, social media. So um, many Tunisians, especially young ones, uh, were already using Facebook and uh, Twitter. The, the 
getting an account or connecting to social media was very hard uh, uh, at that time because, um, for example, before 2011, we didn't in Tunisia have access to YouTube, uh, for example, we didn't have access to um, many other social media. But we had Facebook, and we used Facebook to uh, keep each other uh, informed about what was happening, uh, especially outside of Tunis, because it was very hard between, let's say, at the end of December 2010 uh, and, uh, and the 14th of January, uh, it was very hard to move outside of the capital city. It was very hard to uh, get insights from what was happening. So we used Facebook and Twitter to um, organize ourselves. The third thing is, uh, um, even if we never uh, actually uh, theorized uh, uh, what we did in 2011, uh, we used what we call in Arabic, uh, uh, distract and divide. So uh, um, let's say uh, I was many times in 2011 uh, within the faculty of law in Tunis, and uh, we had 300, between 300 and 500 people uh, uh, ready to go uh, downtown to protest. And we knew that if we had moved uh, all of us at the same time, it would be uh, easier for police to uh, be violent with us so we divided ourselves in um, groups of 10 15 20 people uh, we um, managed to deploy uh, ourselves in uh, many streets of the city which imposed on police forces also to divide uh, itself into uh, smaller groups uh, and we found out that uh, it was much better or much easier for us to do that than to go all of us all together at the same time uh, uh, on Habib Bourguiba, which is the main uh, uh, main uh, street uh, of uh, downtown. Um, so these were the three main ways we used to uh, 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 organize ourselves. But there were also, uh, if I may add, uh, factors, let's say, I, I would say random factors because uh, no one really thought about that, uh, uh, but it happened anyways. Uh, the first uh, factor is uh, how the extent uh, to which the crowd uh, during the protests was uh, diversified. Uh, you had uh, obviously adult men and adult women, uh, uh, but also students. And Ben Ali, uh, we use this as a joke. Ben Ali uh, made one of his biggest mistakes a week before uh, uh, he left the country by closing down all the universities. Uh, in his mind, it was a way to uh, stop students from protesting, but actually, it helped a lot the movement because students were free to uh, uh, go and support uh, the students. But we had also elderly, elder people, older people in, in the crowds and, and children uh, brought up by their parents. I know some might think it's uh, uh, kind of uh, non-responsible, but uh, uh, we think it's the contrary. Uh, the police was facing a crowd of thousands of people and not only adult men, women children elderly and that made uh, made it much more complicated for them to use violence and at some point uh, they finally used it on january 14th uh, but it was too late already mm -hmm. uh, i may raise just one point for the uh, uh, debate uh, we can talk about it later which is impunity i think it's a very important thing and nowadays in tunisia um, the police is not using repression anymore during protests but police is still uh, uh, doing harm to protesters within uh, uh, detention centers, within prisons. Uh, I know Victoria uh, mentioned this point. Um, and now we changed our mindset or our planification from how to do on the street to how to do after the protest once people are uh, in custody, how to protect them and how to react to police violence within detention centers. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Thanks, uh, Ziad. And I finally wanted to turn with Ivan uh, Maravec. Ivan, you were <laughs> a student leader during the, the pro-democracy movement in Serbia and faced uh, no shortage of violence and repression um, and have since worked with activists and movements in various countries around the world. Um, what can you say, building on the conversation up to this point, what can you say about the strategies and the tactics that movements have used uh, to maintain momentum in the face of repression? And what are the common pitfalls um, that they've experienced? Thanks, Maria. So although um, 
I have to say, my experience is from the previous century, so <laughs> it may be a bit outdated. But there are some things that are kind of uh, remain the same. And I think, like you, in your question, you you just kind of put the seeds of an answer. Actually, the point of reacting to repression is actually to maintain mobilization levels and momentum that the movement has, because <clears throat> we have to ask ourselves why. Uh, not just like why regimes use repression, but if repression is so good for the regimes, why they're uh, using it all the time? And the reason why they're not using it all the time is it's too costly. So the way regimes use repression is that if they see an urgent need to quash a movement or to, or to kind of prevent certain kind of behavior by the people, they're going to use repression hoping that this uh, behavior is going to stop and that the movement is going to either fall apart or they're going to uh, uh, like withdraw or they're going to make a mistake or something like that. But if the movement manages to keep on going despite the repression, usually the repression starts falling apart because it's just too costly. And, uh, and it's costly both in terms of uh, resources and in terms of morale of the of the forces that need to enforce that repression, because they need to be convinced that they need, they need to do things that are pretty much extraordinary. So what uh, one of the things that movements uh, successfully do, and this is something that we did back in Serbia, and I also uh, encountered other movements who were doing that, was to have like a combination of uh, tactics of concentration followed by the tactics of dispersion. So if you have uh, people all protesting, and you know, we kind of assume that protest is probably kind of the most uh, uh, talked about and most reported on uh, tactic that, that, that movements use. So you have people protesting in the street and uh, uh, all coalescing in the big towns or a capital city or whatever it is, and then uh, they're faced with a crackdown. Uh, some movements try to do it again, and, 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 and usually they're faced with a like, formidable opponent. But in some cases, including uh, what we did in Serbia, was we actually, instead of tactics of concentration, we opted for tactics of dispersion. So we would do simultaneously smaller uh, gatherings and smaller actions in dozens of towns across the country. That put the regime in a really uh, awkward uh, position because they had only few uh, loyal and, uh, and fierce and well-equipped and well-trained forces, those special forces that could easily deal with us. But if the protests are happening and the actions are happening across the country at the same time, they had to rely on local forces because they had to uh, deal with them simultaneously. And when they, once they had to rely on local forces, the local forces uh, had, were not as good. And also they had like local loyalties because they were coming from those towns and those cities. So they were not as brutal in this repression. So that was, for instance, one of the, one of the things that, 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 that was pretty successful strategy. And I think it can be universal because the logic behind it is actually not country specific, culture specific, or even time specific. This is, like, this is a tactic from a 20th century, let's say, that can be easily replicated in the 21st. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much, Ivan. That's very interesting on the, on the um, strategic value of uh, alternating between methods of concentration and dispersion. I wanted to now turn to our, um, our global audience and take a question from Saif Ahmed Al Hadi who asks Victoria a question. Victoria, do you think a severe challenge is the unpredictable violent tactics that authorities take against the movement? And he goes on to say that I see the youth element as being a critical component in fueling the nonviolent approach. Oh, Victoria, hold on, we're just gonna take you off mute. The Hong Kong case and other cases, because for in the rest of the world, usually you people have lived under dictatorship repression for quite a long time. What has happened with the Hong Kong police is that 
for many years, we will be saying high five to the police forces. They were the most professional across Asia. So this is why even five years ago during the umbrella movement, people would turn themselves in, surrender themselves, never expecting to be beaten up or, 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 or tortured. But now this is why I say that um, it is really against the determination of the entire young generation. And it's also pre precisely because there are these different fr uh, pillars of freedom, especially the rule of law. And therefore the police have been using very, very extreme violence, completely unexpected. And at the same time though, we are also going back to what Jonathan was saying is that it, we are dealing with a high capacity regime in Hong Kong. And the police force, they are very well disciplined, very well trained. And so far that Beijing has not sent out the, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, because they think that they can really rely on the local police forces. So in this case, we're, we're dealing with a very high capacity regime that's willing to do whatever it takes to crack down on the people. And the people are also very, very mobilized. Also, we are, we are talking about a high capacity so society because Hong Kong for many, many decades has always enjoyed freedoms. This is why we have this confrontation, very, very brutal crackdown, turn to violence, but at the same time, also very sustained international local support. It is true that the turn to violence has caused a little bit of that, but still, we, 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 especially even the senators actually went to Hong Kong and say, hey guys, can you, can we, you, we return to non-violence? But still, um, the Senate, the, the House, they all passed the, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, and then uh, even uh, European countries are do, kind of looking at the same model as well. So this is kind of my take. And I mean, part of Saif's question was also the unpredictable nature of the violence. And, you know, one aspect um, of uh, the situation actually in, in most of your cases was the role of non-state actors, so paramilitary groups. Um, and I'm curious how you have thought strategically about how to respond to whether it's triads or whether it was kind of uh, paramilitary groups, whether it was, you know, um, you know in Sudan and kind of the non-traditional armed groups who were using violence against protesters. So how do you think strategically about responding to these actors? Yeah, I think this is a very good question for a lot of Hong Kong people. This is something that they haven't really thought about. And also that I was just writing a piece. The use of thuggish violence is really to incite. The whole point is to incite vigilante justice. And so now in the international media reports that we see these horrifying scenes of protesters beating up others, that actually, I think it's, it's been costly to the movement. And also when protesters, they have themselves from Molotov cocktails and also that because they, they mask themselves, they also dress in black. This then has actually, I think the most horrifying scenes, the worst destructions are done by agent provocateurs. Now, Hong Kong people, because Hong Kong people are glued to the TV, glued to all the videos, so they know who did what, but the international media, the international observers really cannot tell. So they are the huge vandalism of train stations. I, 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 I think that I can actually really, uh, I, we have enough evidence to show that they're not done by protesters, but again, for the international audience, that's really impossible to tell. Yeah. Other responses to the idea of um, paramilitaries? Johnson, I think you have a, um, a response. Yeah, my, my response is more on, you know, my questions to other movement experience because uh, the very reason why Hong Kong people are starting to, we're starting to gear up and escalate the use of force is because in late July, there was paramilitary, there were higher thugs, uh, hired by the government who were attacking people in the trade stations indiscriminately, and it really inframing people. And I think this is part of the, this scenario would always be encountered by organizers or activists or even ordinary citizens in a movement. Because when people were facing the police, you can say, okay, they are the government, so we don't want to fall into the trap or we don't want to be, get more violence from them. But when people are facing paramilitary or a non-state actor, it's really easy and makes sense to, for the protesters to gear up and to fight back so they, they can uh, reduce further harm in the future. So I would like to hear uh, um, other movement experience too. Yvonne or Azaz, do you have thoughts on that? <laughs> 
So I can like I, you know I'm, I'm going to bring another example from the from the 20th century, and we had to deal with a similar problem. So the first time we saw this happening was uh, in Romania in the early 90s uh, when Ion Iliescu was faced with the wave of protests in Bucharest, mostly led by students. He organized uh, secretly what used to be called the Miners' Olympics, which means he organized miners to come down into the city and organize clashes with the with the students. So they started beating up students and then the police had to step in just to kind of maintain order. There are two sides. We have to kind of maintain order. But it actually completely turned the dynamic from students against the regime into like two groups of people fighting. And then how can you be against the miners? Miners are risking their life every day going into the mines. And all. So that was the, the thing. So Milosevic tried the same thing with uh, what we call the counter rally in 1996. We were organizing demonstrations against him and he organized counter demonstrations, like people spontaneously gathering to support the government. But the whole idea was to organize incidents that are going to lead to to uh, declaring of the, the state of law. So they even uh, had like uh, guns were used. They were shooting at protesters. But these were unarmed civilians, uh, not armed, armed, but ununiformed civilians that were armed and that were that were organizing these acts of violence. So what it, it was really difficult for us and we had to maintain like complete separation. We tried to kind of de-escalate as much as we could to prevent and to kind of build a very strong media narrative what is going on. Uh, but still to come back the next day after the counter rally happened and to reclaim the streets because the whole idea was to prevent this uh, narrative of two sides of the civilians trying to fight and then the army stepping in or the police stepping in uh, because that's a trick actually it wasn't really genuine it was actually all employed by the by the regime mm -hmm. that's a really interesting i point. have something to say so. please azaz yeah, so um, in Sudan, in the recent context, uh, there are two ways uh, w in which the government tried to manipulate uh, the, the, the situation by having their own uh, flank. One was doing a counter rally, of course, uh, using the slogan that is opposite to what the people were using. For instance, the people were using uh, the government must go, and the counter rally was using the slogan of no, you must stay. And they gathered their own people and their supporters, and they took um, took over one of the public spaces. The other one was a little bit more controversial and more tricky. Um, uh, during the sit-in where uh, uh, the protester took over a street next to the general command of military in Khartoum as a sit-in from the uh, April 7th until June 3rd, that was a very popular place, and that was like a, a little utopia, if you will. And what the government did used an adjacent area next to it called Colombia, uh, that it's known to be um, uh, a hub for recreational drugs. And what the government said, and they used that pretext as uh, that area as a pretext for the aggression and the excessive use of violence. And it was really interesting because it created this rift within the movement itself and the people in general, the general public, who were like, oh, we don't approve of recreational drugs and we're not going to accept that. This is not our, uh, uh, this is not our code of conduct. This is not our ethics. And at the same time, the younger generation uh, noticing uh, what the government is trying to do and saying, no, uh, Colombia is part of the revolution. The people who are there who are mostly are people who are homeless or without, uh, or come from very uh, underprivileged economic background, they are victims, they are as victims as we are, and they are citizens, citizens, and they should not be neglected. And, and, and it was sad enough that that area has been taken as a pretext for the use, the excessive use of violence uh, on the June 3rd, because the government until recently, their narrative is like, we tried to disperse uh, Colombia, which was a drug hub, uh, but we did not want it to do anything with the set in. So it was quite interesting, and I think that was, um, it was also a, a learning a curve for the movement itself about accepting people and, and the social economic divide that a lot of people didn't look beyond just being poor, but they didn't, that was like um, a 
like for them to see the choices that people underprivileged sometimes are left with and how they can live and what their choices are. Uh, but it did succeed, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, in, in minimizing the support for the people who live in that area. Uh, as, as a result, uh, many of them might not uh, get justice for their killing or what they have faced. Mm. Thanks, Azaz. I wanted to take two questions uh, that are related. The first one from Sege Medin. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, Sega asks, what has been the role of women as movement uh, creators? And then the related uh, question from Madison is um, about the gender breakdown of each of your movements. And her question specifically is, do women frame their grievances differently or are women's issues adopted in the overall movement agenda? Somebody want to take a stab on that? Azaz, I know you had some um, reflections on women's roles in Sudan. Do you want to take that now or let somebody else? Yeah, sure. Um, I would I would say that I was just recently in Sudan and I had the honor to work with um, more than 60 women who were part of the revolution. And it, it was really remarkable. Like I know they are part of the revolution, but when you look at the at the ways and, 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 and their engagement, it's just astonishing. They were not just showing up in mass numbers. Uh, it was way beyond that. Uh, many women uh, who were not necessarily political activists or necessarily like your average activists were really involved in the in the mobilization. They were involved in getting people's message, uh, getting messages to people who are hard to reach. Uh, they were also uh, very um, uh, engaged in the uh, when it comes to to, to the organization of events, for instance, uh, 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 doing the logistics, um, um, uh, making sure who's who and who is where, uh, getting permission uh, for a lot of the protesters, especially the younger ones. Uh, it, that was a very um, uh, important part because we are a communal society. Uh, a lot of people, like, it really matters to them the validation of their family and, the, and, and what their family says, especially for women, younger generation. And a lot of women were actually asking their girls to show up they were asking their girls to go and even those who could come from more restrict environment they were trying to provide help in another way like for instance uh doing the social media campaigns making sure that they're posting the photos making sure that the message is getting across doing the logistics for the uh, underground groups to meet Together and all that, and that was not only just in urban settings. That was even in in areas that are remote, where women uh, participation in politics is not really uh, perceived as something okay or accepted by the society. And at the same time, even in IDP camps, where internally displaced uh, uh, people, uh, most of the mover uh, movement leaders and the grassroots leaders were actually women. Uh, and also the other uh, uh, rule that a lot of people don't realize is keeping this movement peaceful and and nonviolent. Uh, that was actually uh, 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 most of it put on the shoulder of women because they were the one who are trying to promote the ethos of peacefulness, trying to remind the men, because we have this culture where women in the war um, culture, they are usually the one who instigate men to go and, and take revenge and all that. They actually reversed that and they became the one who are calling for nonviolence, reminding men that the strength is not about just use of violence, it's not about being uh, irrational and angry, it's actually about being wise. So they, they were, integral leaders of this movement in ways and, 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 and means that they were not the usual way, but it was the best uh, way possible for them to do so, given the culture and the structure of the, of the, of the, of the society there. One last thing is like during the sit-in that, that lasted for almost two months and a half, the, the, the core, uh, the bees, uh, or the one who were doing the heavy lifting of the logistics were actually women. Uh, for a lot of people to stay there 24 seven and remain put uh, during the sit-in, it required a lot of other women who are at home to take uh, take the responsibility of those who are uh, 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 guarding the sit-in. And that was also done by women, providing the food, providing the logistics, providing even protection, uh, providing the sense of family and conviv convivial uh, atmosphere, it was put on women. Um, uh, women doctors were mainly remarkably seen and during the sit-in. So it's, 
they were everywhere. Uh, uh, sadly, though, uh, when it came to the political process and when it came to the to, to the after the the negotiation part, and and that women were not as uh, as recognized, and, and they were like almost told, okay, thank you, we got it from here. And um, uh, this is a new struggle now for women in Sudan. They are trying to take their space and curve their space, uh, uh, while also consolidate their own differences within them and there's a new uh, woman movement emerging from Sudan and it's very uh, the, the the prospects are very uh, uh, promising uh, despite the setback and the challenges but it's very promising and and this new Sudanese woman now there are like 10 times stronger than they were before so imagine uh, how strong they are now <laughs> thanks Azaz any other thoughts on the kind of the gendered aspects of your, of the movements yeah so uh, in Hong Kong, the same too. Uh, we see the same phenomenon that more women are taking up prominent roles and organizing role, and they have do a um, very good jobs in using their um, role in the movement. So for example, uh, after um, the students break into the legislature building, uh, a lot of mothers hold a uh, assembly and uh, they were trying to subvert the narratives of student vandalizing uh, uh, buildings into something like the students were uh, desperate and as mother as parents um, you, you have to understand them so we see you know more uh, women are taking up uh, permanent roles in the movement but at the same time what i would like to emphasize is um, Having women to take up a permanent role doesn't mean that we will achieve gender equality into the movement, right? Because um, as for uh, gender equality, we also need to respect the femininities of women and uh, their specific uh, ways of engagement in the social movement. And I would say in the Hong Kong context, in the Hong Kong movement, uh, we still have yet to respect that kind of fit. Uh, and this is kind of related to um, the questions on violence. Um, part of the reason why some women will be excluded from the front line is because you know they face huge violence, and oftentimes women are seen as um, uh, less um, skillful in uh, fighting the police. Um, so uh, sometimes they would uh, face discrimination, or they would be looked down upon. Uh, if they were trying to be at the front line. And at the same time, uh, because there is this, um, uh, uh, because uh, uh, the use of force is, has become an, uh, one of the main tactics in the protest, uh, it also uh, discouraged some of the uh, participations of women um, because, you know, again, structurally, um, women as, are seen as a, a weaker subject uh, in fighting the police. So. Uh, this brought us to the questions of, you know, if we really want to include everyone, if we want to include a, uh, if we want to have a movement that is uh, inclusive, so what kind of tactics or what kind of mixed tactics should we use and uh, uh, how should we be flat, how should we alter our tactics would be something that all of us have to learn. No, thanks, Johnson. That's really interesting. And I, I think that's one of the kind of the research findings about um, the introduction of violent tactics is that it tends to, on average, reduce p active participation. And if that's a primary strategic interest to increase uh, participation and certainly to increase participation of women, um, that's where kind of the introduction of violence can be can be problematic. And you know, it only, generally in, in in these struggles, it's young, able-bodied men who are uh, throwing the molotovs or or the bricks or whatever. So that's a kind of um, exclusionary approach, if you will. But but it, it was interesting what you said. Um, one other question we have from. Um, Neda Zodi, who says, it seems a critical factor for your movement success is long-standing networks that uh, predated major actions. During the off times, how can you evaluate if networks and relationships in civil society are strong enough to seize windows of opportunities once they open? That's a really good question. Somebody want to take that one? So I'm happy to offer a couple of thoughts on the, uh, the pre-existing networks question, just from a sort of general perspective. And then I'd love to hear, I mean, I'd love to hear from sort of each of, each of the, the activists and others here about sort of specific movements as well. I mean, I think this existence of pre-existing networks, I mean, I agree with the premise of the, 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 question, the question that in many cases, these, these are absolutely crucial uh, for maintaining mobilization, that you know, in the moment, 
uh, individual, like individual large-scale protests may, you know, may seem entirely spontaneous, but there are oftentimes, yeah, these long-standing existing organizations uh, that can, you know, that can serve as mobilizing structures that can connect different segments of society uh, in order to, uh, in order to lead to these sort of massive moments of mobilization. Um, I, I think in particular, I mean, I, I'd be curious, as Azaz, to hear your thoughts. You brought up the uh, Sudan Professionals Association uh, beforehand as sort of one of the key factors uh, that linked together different groups uh, in, the, in the uprising in Sudan. Uh, so I'd be curious to hear sort of your thoughts on this, on this question. Yeah, sure. So uh, this is exactly what happened in Sudan, that most of it, it was all of these groups and interest groups and some of them are professional, some of them are uh, interest groups like those who suffered from land grabbing or those who are from underdeveloped areas. All of them like did their own mini movement, if you will. They had uh, most of the tactics, uh, doing the picketing, doing the mobilization, having their own messaging, but they were all scattered in a way. Uh, what happened during the revolution is all these small groups that already had some experience in the field of mobilizing and already have established their constituency, they already have their own integrity, uh, and they already have paid their dues, uh, whether being arrested or being subject to torture or whatever. So they already gained the trust of their communities. Uh, they were, they came together. Uh, the bigger umbrella was the Sudanese Press, uh, Professional Association, which was made up of seven uh, organizations. They were mainly white collar organizations like teachers and 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 uh, doctors, syndicates, and engineers. Uh, but also, they were wearing multiple hats as well. Whether by geographic um, 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 associations, so some of them were from war uh, zones. Some of them were affected by other underdevelopment. Um, uh, 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 like they were like from parts that are, have different grievances. So they they were like kind of like veterans. Uh, and, and what they did is like they brought, uh, the, they became an umbrella and they came with this uh, declaration of freedom and change, which was the manifesto, if you will, for the movement. And uh, people started to sign to it. And most of the signatories to the freedom and change declaration were already people who had their own share of organizing and grassroots movement on the ground so uh, uh, most of so the thing is like the the learning or the teaching of tactics of nonviolent resistance was very minimal uh, what happened it was for the uh, uh, SBA is to streamline this massive uh, effort from components and sectors of the society into one channel and make it like go in one stream together. But I feel like uh, had not these groups already worked and had their own experiences in mobilizing and and and, and nonviolent resistance already, even if they don't know it and if they don't call it that, it would have been much slower progress for the movement to move in because people were ready. They knew what a protest means. They knew what it means to do uh, messaging. They knew how to keep it secret, they knew how to uh, respond to counter uh, messages, they already had their share. And I think because, again, this did not start in 2018. This had started way long before that, and it was incremental, and it became, uh, um, uh, and we have two waves of uh, 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 popular protests in Sudan already in 2013 and 2016. So already people had, these uh, tactics had been ingrained in their psyche and people were like already ready. So it was there all along. It just needed an activation. And the catalyst was the move, uh, the protest, the worsening of the economic situation. And then you had this leadership already of people that you know and trust you've been already with in, in, in different battles with the government are telling you where to go. So, um, uh, uh, and, and, and I attribute a lot of the success for this movement for the existing old interest group, grassroots group specifically, who were already doing their own battles and they, they were doing their own uh, efforts. And then when the time came, they were ready to join and amplify and, and, and scale up. Um, I might add something to, to... Hang on, guys. Just one. Yeah. So uh, a colleague of mine who was watching the Facebook video before just sent me an email and said that the video has stopped. Uh, I'm not able to see it on Facebook either. So I think we may... Oh, just it's still talking. recording. It's still recording, though. It is still recording. Okay. Yeah. But okay, it, great. Let's keep talking then. <laughs> okay. But, but uh, so, yeah, I, I agree. Ahead, yeah. I, I can see the, the 
Facebook Live uh, video. But uh, let, let, let's keep on talking. Um, I, I, was, I was going to say that uh, um, trying to answer Nadez's question, which uh, uh, is related to, to uh, the evaluation of networks and, and how strong the relationship uh, are uh, to seize opportunities. And I, I, um, in my opinion, it's more a bet than a real evaluation, uh, especially where uh, uh, when you are in the heat of the of the movement um, itself. But uh, what helped us in 2011 in Tunisia, and even after that in, in different protests, sensitive during sensitive times, is to see uh, um, public figures, uh, to see personali personalities who never took uh, positions before, uh, whether it was against the dictatorship of, or in other uh, protests, um, see these people go in the streets uh, uh, and and support the movement or, um, or gave the message to the uh, public opinion to uh, go in the streets that uh, it might not be safe, but this is the moment to go there. So you could have uh, you could see in 2011 uh, judges. Um, who, who would face severe uh, uh, oppression if uh, uh, the dictatorship uh, had lasted after 2011. Uh, sometimes I remember um, in two or three protests, uh, we, uh, uh, on our way to downtown Tunis, we faced um, uh, police uh, blockades and some of the policemen just made few steps on the side of the street to allow people to go beyond the, the, the blockage. So um, it, it wasn't, uh, there were, were no direct communication because, between the protesters and the police, but uh, I mean, this gives you a sign that the word is spreading, that uh, 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 the opinions are uh, uh, in accordance with each other, whether it's between the protesters or with the police officers. And uh, and uh, again, I think it's more bet than a real assessment uh, of the situation. Johnson or Ivan or Victoria, do you have any thoughts on this uh, this question? So if I can, you know, say that, uh, you know, the we used to have like this uh, funny uh, saying back in the day it would say that you know for success we need just three things and that's organization organization and organization so <laughs> so in a sense these kind of uh, networks that are kind of already existing are important because they reflect the horizontal nature of the movement it's not one organization it's actually like uh, some sort of a mycelium that is happening under the ground if you use the the like a fungi and fungi as a as a as a so this is you know networks of 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 uh, of organizations that are uh, kind of growing underground and when the rain falls then the mushrooms pop up so the 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 mobilization is the result of 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 that effort and if you look at those regimes who are very very adamant at at preventing uh, social movements from popping up what are they doing? They're actually trying to uh, limit the work of all these networks and, and existing organizations, be it youth organizations, professional organizations. Look at Russia and what, what Putin has been doing. Look at other countries where they're preventing people from self-organizing because they understand that self-organizing will one day be the springboard for, uh, for kind of potential mobilization. Yeah. Um, yeah. On the on the organization um, point, um, back to the well. So there is a comparison between um, the 2014 umbrella movement and the protest movement that is uh, occurring right now. Back to 2014, you know, the uh, protest war was led by a network of organization, and. Um, they were advocating nonviolence, and this is part of the reasons why um, the uh, in the in, in the movement that's five years ago, uh, a lot of people were uh, forming a packer team, and they were asking people not to escalate their use of force. But that was when things uh, started to flip. Um, that uh, a lot of uh, leading organization in the umbrella umbrella movement they were challenged by um, the. Uh, activists and uh, organizer who emerge in uh, 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 from this movement, and so 
I think one of the challenge to traditional way or uh, traditional social movement organization uh, in this century is uh, most of the movement nowadays are very decentralized. Um, and the first hole of participating or organizing social movement is also lower because, you know, people have more techniques in doing so, like online canvassing, you know, and also it's really easy to connect people right now who, who think the same way as you do. Um, so how does traditional social movement organization um, deal with this kind of challenge uh, will be a subject that uh, uh, need to think more about. And building on this uh, new ways of um, social movement mobilization, it will also pose new challenge to um, the disciplines of um, protests because now you have people who are very diverse, they are from different social background, they may have a different perceptions of what is permissible and what is not. Um, and oftentimes uh, we will need uh, more resources or time to um, deliberate and also to build consensus uh, among the movement. We don't have very much time left, but um, I just wanted to uh, allow and uh, um, encourage our panelists to offer a final minute or so of reflection as we wrap up um, our Facebook Live event today. So Victoria, how about we start with you? So we just need to, just one second, Victoria, when we're gonna unmute you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so the, the, the last question before we got cut off was then how do, do people, you know, can when they're lying low and things are not in, in kind of like in, just in recess, how do you get prepared for when the opportunity opens up? And then um, several of the speakers said that, well, yeah, because they were actually pre-existing networks. So if I bring that back to Hong Kong is that uh, Hong Kong, because for a long time, has had the freedom to to get organized, unlike in, in, for example, in Syria, in other places where essentially the whole idea of the regime is to even stifle that kind of ability to get self-organized. And then the, the, the very distinctive feature of the movements now is this leaderless nature. I would say that that is a really raw, uh, misnomer because you have many, many different organizations working together. The only problem is that there's no central leadership and then at the same time, I will also say that people have taken the lesson that the umbrella movement failed because it was too um, so disciplined in terms of not ever turning to anything, not even uh, throwing a piece of rock. And also listen, after listening to the experiences of Tunisia and, uh, and Sudan and even in Serbia, it kind of seems that Hong Kong people have done a lot of the right things. They have extensive grassroots supports. They have cross cross class alliances. They have cross regional cooperation. They've done all you know the whole range of nonviolent activities, uh, boycotts, strikes, human chain, linen walls. In addition, and also um, also they also have these people organizing into smaller groups to distract and divide the police. So like they've done everything. But at the same time, back to what I was saying earlier, that Hong Kong is confronting with a very high capacity regime. So that's the challenge. And at the same time, I, I think the biggest asset for Hong Kong to maintain resilience is this very strong society. So which means that to go to, for the way forward is to think about uh, organized boycotts, is to think about you know other forms of strikes and also forming people already talking about forming this alternative yellow pro-democracy network and so these things are really should be uh, explored better. Okay, thanks very much, Victoria. Jonathan? Oh, just one second, Jonathan. Oh, I got it. Okay. Uh, I think, we, yeah, we only have about two or three minutes left. So in the interest of giving sort of the, the actual activists here time to speak, I will, I will yield my time to, uh, to the activists. Okay, sounds good. Johnson? Right. So. As a long-term um, non-violent tactics practitioner, this movement is really widened my horizon in understanding violence and also the use of fossil protesters. So my first uh, key takeaway, I would say, from this movement is we need more understanding uh, of the capacities of why people are choosing one tactics and you know how different tactics can cooperate with each other, um, and also. Um, facing such a huge capacities, uh, such a, the most powerful of terror regimes in history, which is China. Um, what I learned from Sudan or from Serbia experiences is um, one movement or one 
moment, it might not get us、uh, anywhere. But a, a continuous participation、um, and high commitment from its population, it will be the way forward. So, which lead us to the discussions of you know how do we build the resiliencies of、um, protesters and how、uh, external actor stakeholders like international community、um, can pay close co-、uh, attention to continuous movement? Because what we are facing now is、uh, a lot of people, more than five thousand and eight hundred people are already arrested. Forty percent of them are students. Many of them are charged with rioting that will get them. Similarly, ten years of imprisonment, and to this individual,、uh, the sense of injustice and the sense of unfairness uh, would uh, would probably drain them、um, to uh, uh, to support even you know a、uh, uh, more violent way of、uh, struggle, which is justifying、um, because、um, the injustice that happens on them uh, 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 it is just so unreasonable. So. How can external actor to understand the grievances of、uh, the people who are suffering?、Uh, how we、uh, lay support、uh, in a, build a, a strong support network that can help them to overcome the challenge that they are facing、uh, would be something that、uh, serve as a legacy to the next wave of protest movement.、Um, in this movement, a lot of people are already saying that they are going to form unions. Uh, like Victoria said, we are going to form a pro-democracy、uh, network that will support、uh, businesses who are、uh, also pro-democracy. So this will be the legacy for the future movement, and、uh, and I think this is the beauty of people's power movement.、Uh, it's it's not going to stop at one point. It's a continuous struggle. Thank you very much, Johnson Azaz. Yeah. So、uh, two things. One first.、Uh, uh, For、what I learned、uh, observing Sudanese,、uh, the revolution in Sudan is that remaining grassroots gets you far. It really takes you far. First, it makes it sustainable. It makes it、uh, more persistent, and it minimizes the use of、uh, force because you have your own people on on the streets, and、uh, and people are invested more in it for it to win, and、uh, it's easier for you to have people、um, uh, join you, and it will be more authentic and more real.、Uh, one lesson learned that is、uh, a little bit of a bittersweet that came out of this resolution is that when the time came for the political、uh, Uh, part or phase,、uh, most of the movements were not ready,、uh, whether for lack of capacity or because they were not prepared for that.、Um, there was not enough preparedness or readiness、uh, to 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 have the same momentum and the same、uh, level or leverage when it came to the political one. And this is a, a challenge that is still happening now and persisting. So it would be really interesting to see how movements uh, uh, transform from active dissent into a state building, into a little bit、uh, tapping into the uh, uh, not necessarily the institutional、uh, ways, but also at the same time、uh, um, changing their tactics and and and、uh, and, 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 and 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 ways in which they are engaged with the government that quote unquote could be representative of the revolution, but it's not necessarily、uh, addressing. All the challenges and the grievances of the people. So、uh, I feel like this is、um, a, a little bit of a、uh, not a plateau per se, but、um, the movement now in Sudan is is a little bit feeling、um, off balance、uh, because they don't know how to deal with this new government that is supposedly to be a representative of the revolution, yet is still not addressing what the movement wanted or most of the major grievances when it comes to accountability and justice. And、uh, and they're finding that protest is not enough.、Uh, they're not having enough. Stakeholders joining in because there are people who are actually have buy in in the government more than the grievances of those who are protesting. So this is going to be an interesting moment to see how the movement or these interest group,、uh, if they're going to do a solidarity, if they're going to do a big union. If I don't know, it, it, we're watching it and I'm watching it as well. But I feel like this was one of the biggest this back is I don't know if it was the readiness or it's the circumstances or.、Um, um, I don't know.、Um, I'm, I'm yet trying to figure it out. Yeah, thank、But、you. But remain grassroots. That's the main thing. <laughs> That's the message.、Uh, Ziad.、Yeah. Oh, I completely agree with.、Uh, as I said, I think it was. Uh, it's um, 
a key uh, a key factor for the sustainability of the movement to, to remain uh, 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 as much close to the to the to its roots than possible the movement in 2011 in tunisia uh, is mainly or very often considered as being a leaderless movement uh, because we had no face representing uh, the, the protesters. Uh, I, I, I much more like to prefer to say that it's a leaderful movement because everybody in the street uh, um, uh, uh, acted and behaved as, as a leader uh, uh, when the time uh, uh, imposed that. So um, it helped us even now in 2019, uh, keeping the idea or, or the soul of the revolution alive in Tunisia. Uh, and uh, with all the bad things that happened after 2011 in Tunisia, we still, um, or there are still many people believing in uh, uh, the core idea of the revolution. And this is because we kept the movement uh, uh, close to its uh, roots. So I completely agree with uh, Azaz on this. Thanks very much, Ziad. Ivan, bring us home. Yeah, so, uh, you know, kind of to uh, say that, you know, when we are thinking about or we are, uh, uh, we say, worried about the repression that we may face, we should also remember that the regime is worried as well about that repression. And first, because it's costly. Second, because it can backfire. Third, because I remember when we actually, after Milosevic uh, was brought down and we got uh, uh, to access the internal communication, uh, there was a point where Odpor was uh, declared a terrorist organization, despite the fact that we never used violence and there was like this big crackdown. Thousands of activists were arrested and all this stuff. Uh, a year later, when we actually got to see the internal communication, we saw what chaos was behind. And like everybody was like, it was, we thought we were facing like this formidable machine that is going to kind of arrest us all and put us down. But actually when we saw what was going on behind was actually a completely different picture. It was, everybody was trying to save their uh, own little turf and like to kind of shift the blame to somebody else. If things go wrong, people didn't want to get uh, in, involved. So in a sense, when we worry about repression, we should know that uh, the, the other side is worried about, and this gives us hope. Thanks very much, Ivan. Well, I wanted to thank this remarkable virtual panel of scholars and activists um, from around the world for offering their perspectives on what is, I think, a really timely and important topic of what how movements face repression. And I wanted to thank you all uh, around the world for tuning in and for um, asking great uh, questions and making um, such uh, helpful comments. And so um, on behalf of the Institute, I want to thank everyone for joining and wish you all a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe.